one more announcement before we start, and that's, could you please turn your... Uh, Dr. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here in Mumbai, uh, such a wonderful, vibrant city of art, culture, enterprise and science, and truly one of the great world cities. And um, it's uh, also humbling to be with so many very distinguished people uh, today who have done and are doing so much uh, to advance the interests of people in Indian society, particularly the children, uh, who of course will make such a difference. Uh, to the future of this marvelous country. Um, I'm very struck by what an honor it is for me to be able to uh, be with you today, uh, coming from Worcester in England, uh, such a, a small city. Uh, and I did a little bit of arithmetic um, before I came here. And for every one person who lives in Worcester, there are 200 here in Mumbai alone. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, I'm just very conscious uh, that um, uh, we have so much to learn from you, um, but I hope that what I have to say over the next few minutes will also be of some interest uh, to you. And so, let me introduce uh, my uh, small city and the uh, university that I have the uh, privilege of serving as their Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive. Um, uh, to you and say something about our work in this very important area of inclusive education. And now I'm going to hope that this works. <laughs> that nobody here needs to know that. But early years education is still a passion for us and it's still actually a great cause around the world because our little children are so often neglected um, and their opportunity uh, to learn when their brains are so uh, alive and plastic and ready uh, to um, embrace knowledge and uh, the newness of life, um, uh, we need to do uh, so much more. So the university became interested in early years education and we're dedicated to working with children. So we're a university which has an annual children's festival of storytelling. Um, there are no students at the university under the age of 18, but all of these people in this picture are attending university events and um, uh, singing, um, uh, playing, uh, listening, creating, reading, uh, and engaging, and so important for the future. And also, uh, we became concerned with what is often called special educational needs. And we realize that many children have impairments and difficulties and obstacles in the way of learning and actually also functioning as citizens in society. And so we became very committed to special educational needs. And this is not only true in education, but it's in, in part of um, uh, participating in society. And this picture is uh, one of our uh, staff. Um, who is actually an expert psychologist and sports psychologist working with uh, a young woman with a considerable physical disability but who is still participating in sport as well as in education and how important that is. Now, of course, the university uh, in Worcester, starting from being a tiny teacher training college in emergency wartime buildings, two of which we still have. They were built in 1941 with a 10-year life. Uh, we recently put a new roof on one of them um, uh, and with a 15-year guarantee. So I imagine that it may turn out to be uh, a 100-year life for these buildings. Um, we uh, are well known also for our work with our own students in terms of supporting them and uh, we have uh, played a role 
nationally in the United Kingdom in developing uh, an important appreciation of the uh, significance of students having good mental health and being resilient. Um, and so you can see why we are so interested in working with uh, Swaroop here, whom I will come to uh, in a little uh, while, um, uh, in developing a diploma in uh, personal and social education and in life skills and in trying to develop uh, uh, that. But um, just a little bit more about the way in which the university has tried to develop facility with this idea of celebrating inclusion and what people can do. Now, the young lady in the picture that you see who is playing wheelchair basketball is a young woman called Sophie Carrigal. And at the age of 16, uh, she was like um, many other young girls uh, and uh, just happy, enjoying life, had just taken her um, uh, general certificate of education, uh, which is taken at the age of 16 in England. Um, she went on a family holiday to the United States, was a passenger in a car, the only person who was wearing her seatbelt, and she had, uh, the car was involved in a, cat in a terrible collision, um, and she was uh, found uh, not really breathing, having very little pulse, um, uh, had multiple operations, um, her life was saved, but it was discovered that her spinal cord had been severed and so she is now paralyzed from the waist down. Well, here she is when she was a student at the university uh, four years ago. Um, she uh, studied psychology, which I'm delighted to say she got a first class honors degree, which she earned. Um, but she also became, during that period, the captain of the Great Britain women's basketball team, wheelchair basketball team. And she's playing um, basketball in the University of Worcester Arena. Uh, the university, like Every other of the 130 universities in Britain has a sports hall. But unlike any other university, in fact, any other institution in the whole of Britain, our sports hall was purpose designed to include the wheelchair athlete, which simply means that the courts are a little bit longer because it takes um, it's the same dimension for playing, but the runoff is a bit, uh, is a bit more because it takes you a little longer to stop in a wheelchair than it does when you can use your legs. And the changing rooms are bigger. And so here you have um, the picture of this facility, which is alive with children, but which can also include the wheelchair athlete. And inclusion has other dimensions uh, as well, um, which we have become concerned about. Uh, and the um, ability to help children and young people, but also adults who have dyslexia. The print appears to dance in front of them when they read because they can't hold their focus and their eyes. And people would say, you're stupid because you can't read. But actually, if you've ever tried to read, perhaps through a distorting mirror, and the picture and the print seems to move up and down, you see how difficult it is. And it's amazing that people can read at all, let alone slowly. So we become concerned with overcoming this and with creating uh, opportunity for people. And here is a short film about one of our students who was a little bit older when he came to us and um, uh, what it means to him uh, to become uh, a person with a university degree who can now use a computer and use words in his daily life uh, and occupation and profession. So we'll just um, perhaps uh, dim the lights now and play, play a film. I'm always uh, nervous of having a film with such distinguished uh, uh, people here. But it, the good thing is it only lasts a minute and 19 seconds. So we'll see. Mark Scriven, uh, one of my colleagues, he directs our strength and conditioning at the university on, on a daily basis. He encourages young people to make more of themselves physically, but he always says the most important thing is character and how it's not what happens to you in life, but how you react it, which, do, which do you react to it, which defines you as a person. And of course, he's a very inspirational figure, and we're delighted that he's very recently been elected to be a governor of the university uh, as well. 
um, coming from a background in which uh, people expected that his university would be prison, um, in which he would serve one long sentence after another. But he's broken free from that, and the university, we're delighted um, to be able to help. Now, uh, I know that we have um, many uh, political as well as educational leaders here. And one of the other aspects of um, universities is that they can play a very important role, not only in education, in science and knowledge, um, but they can play and, uh, in reaching out to the community in which uh, they're based but also that they can be an important, as I put it here, engine of regeneration physically for a city, if they're based in a city. And I just want to introduce you to a little of what the University of Worcester has done. Now, the building that you see here, the major building, uh, is actually uh, the former building of the Worcester Royal Infirmary, which was a, a, a large hospital for its time, um, built in 1775, and it's where the British Medical Association was founded in 1832. And I know we have a number of distinguished medical doctors uh, here today. Uh, the British Medical Association, founded um, by Sir Charles Hastings in 1832, uh, in this building. Uh, and we still have the boardroom uh, and um, uh, original things uh, there. Um, and uh, the university has also made a, a contribution with with other buildings, and down at the bottom, uh, we have, for instance, uh, created a, a mock uh, law court, uh, and you can see that uh, there. This is the Worcester Royal Infirmary in 2005, and if you look carefully, it had been abandoned. Uh, you can see uh, rubble in front of the buildings. Um, you can see that uh, there were um, uh, surgical blocks which had become redundant, and, and I can assure you that everything in it which could be stolen had been stolen um, by the time the university got it, um, and that it was used as a center for all sorts of nefarious uh, and criminal activities. Um, this is the uh, Worcester Royal Infirmary, our city campus today. Um, you can see that this was uh, taken recently because, of course, the photograph was taken by a drone. Um, and um, uh, that's how you get this, this type of photography. Uh, we have new halls of residence on the right. Um, and uh, actually, the marquee in the center that you see is the marquee for our annual children's festival of, uh, of storytelling and poetry. And the... Um, uh, doctor's residence has been refurbished uh, for offices, and the Royal Infirmary building itself has been fully refurbished and provides a home for our business school. So suddenly it's transformed into, instead of a derelict site, an engine of opportunity. And uh, we've done something else in Worcester. We've created a new library, which I'll say something about. But this was the dust cart depot in about 2008. Now this site actually was very rich archaeologically because it turned out that it had been a rubbish dump and a place for conducting industrial activity uh, for over 2,000 years because on it we found um, an oven which the Romans used for smelting iron 2,000 years ago. Um, and uh, we also found slippers which were worn by somebody in around 1400 AD and the uh, castings of some bells of a church which we know precisely uh, were put in in 1465 because we know when the bells were put in and we found the iron castings. So it was for many hundreds of years the dust cart depot and it was on the wrong side of the town ditch which tells you everything you need to know. This is it today, um, and uh, uh, the same site um, with the Hive Library. Now, the Hive Library um, is not uh, built in gold. I know it looks as if it's built in gold. It, it's actually a very inert copper alloy, which is a very good building material, uh, relatively inexpensive, um, which uh, lasts a long time. And it's the first university and public library in Britain. And actually, it's the first integrated university and public library in the whole of Europe. And uh, this means that um, 
Not only is it a wonderful facility for our university students and staff, but it's open from 8.30 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, virtually every day of the year. It closes for Christmas and a few bank holidays, but otherwise it's open. And that means that in August, and I was uh, talking with some colleagues earlier, and I said, you know what university libraries are like in August, certainly in England, which is there's nobody in them. If you died between the book stacks, it would be some weeks before you were found. <laughs> nobody, would come and, nobody would come and rescue you. Um, uh, they're busy in term time, but they're very quiet, particularly in the long summer vacation. Um, if you come to the Hive Library in August, it's, it's wonderful. It's full of children in particular. It has a children's library at its heart. It's full of parents and grandparents, citizens of all ages, reading, studying, enjoying themselves. It's a center of activity. And in the first year that we opened the Hive, teenage readership increased by 356% in terms of borrowing. And the number of people uh, joining the public library increased 600% in the, in the first year. And it's, st it's stabilized now three times greater than it used to be every year. And it's been open uh, for, for six years. So it's become a true engine of educational opportunity. This is one of our children's laureates, Michael Rosen, uh, who's appearing at the Hive. You can see just behind him it's what we call the cheese wall, which is a wonderful place for children to climb into and read books. And there are little, there are little spaces there where w books are hidden, and then the children can take, open it and find a book or something else which is interesting and educational and use. And the Hive was interesting enough that it uh, attracted, um, I'm delighted to say, uh, this lady who is reasonably well known, um, uh, and, um, and her husband, who is also well known, uh, to come to open the library in, in 2012. And we were, we were delighted uh, that during her uh, jubilee year, uh, Her Majesty the Queen came uh, to uh, uh, open the library um, in 2012. And so the library has become inclusive at heart. And this lady, when this picture was taken, was our Secretary of State for Education. And the hive is a great leveler. And you'll notice that she's straight away down to the same level as the children. Um, uh, she's very high as our Secretary of State for Education. She's a delightful uh, colleague, Nikki Morgan. And here she is. And these children are all actually representatives of their class. They're uh, in primary school. But it's a, there's a democracy. And they are all elected. Uh, and they're learning how to participate. And so, of course, uh, the Secretary of State wanted to come. This gives you a sensation of the library. And here's a minister for schools. And you can see there's a theme here. Uh, if you come, uh, and we hope very much that you'll all come and visit, you'll have to get down on the floor with the children um, and, uh, and, and realize that we're all human beings learning together. And this is at the heart of this center, uh, this uh, wonderful idea uh, of inclusion. Um, and the university is deeply committed to art. We were committed to education. We have some wonderful science at the university. But this uh, man here is um, uh, now a visiting professor of ours. He was on the staff for many years, Pete Grobler. Um, and uh, he is our mayor with a, a, an exhibition of uh, postcards, which illustrationists from around the world have sent to us um, uh, about the theme of migration and what it means to them. And, um, uh, the world's leading, leading illustrators have all created and given a postcard, and we've made an exhibition of it. And this is one of Pete's um, uh, uh, famous uh, works. He's illustrated Aesop's Fables, which, of course, um, uh, uh, a wonderful um, uh, historic uh, set of fables. Now, the hive also gives us the opportunity to reach out in other ways in inclusion, and this is all about the inclusive ethos. And a few years ago, we had, as one of our early exhibitions in the Hive, an exhibition from an organization here in India based in Chennai called Tara Books. And um, Tara uh, produces books which are made by hand, a number of them, um, in, as part of their series, and they're books for children who cannot see. And so the book, how can you have a book which you can't see, well, obviously by touch. And so um, the, the heat of the sun here in India, pretty hot most of the time, 
is represented by sandpaper, rough paper. And uh, I've seen films of children being introduced to these books in the first time, and literally, the children are so excited to find this story that they start licking the book with their tongue to get the sensation. And because their imagination is made alive by this wonderful story, which they can't read, but they can, they can experience by touch. And we were introduced to this marvelous work by um, uh, a, a wonderful group of educationalists uh, based, in, based in Chennai. Now, how is it possible to come to Mumbai <laughs> and not talk about cricket? I mean, for people of my generation, Sunil Gavaskar, poetry on the cricket pitch when, 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 when in his pomp and batting. And of course, more recently, the great Sachin Tendulkar. Um, it's a shame that Donald Bradman isn't, wasn't alive at the same time. We could have seen who was the greatest batsman ever. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll know. So how is it possible? Well, this is uh, the cricket ground at Worcester, which is, which is uh, considered by many to be the epitome of English cricket because of this view. There's the cricket ground, a first-class match taking place, and there is Worcester Cathedral in the background. Um, what is perhaps not so well known is that Basil D'Oliveira played his professional career at Worcestershire County Cricket Club, as well as playing for England. And of course, you will all know that it was the refusal of the South African government to accept Basil D'Oliveira um, uh, because of his color, which led to the sporting boycott of South Africa, and which led to so much, and which, of course, your country played such a wonderful role uh, in, in such a, a progressive and intelligent and determined way. And Basil, um, uh, whose son I've uh, played cricket with and actually faced my last ball uh, ag against him. Uh, sadly, he passed away a few years ago. Um, and his grandson plays for Worcestershire uh, today. But also, perhaps, what, well, not, what is not well known is that Worcestershire is the first county cricket club in England, first-class club, to have um, uh, an England player, captain it, who was actually born in India. And this is Vikram Solanki, who went on to be chair of the Professional Cricketers Association, born in Udaipur, um, and uh, the first uh, Indian to be the captain of an English county cricket club. Now here is the same picture, the same cricket being played, um, but if you look at the picture on the right hand, you'll notice if you look carefully at this man who's about to catch the ball, that he's only got one arm. And this is a picture that was taken uh, this summer, just gone. Um, and uh, uh, it's the first uh, triangular international tournament to take place in England between uh, England, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, Pakistan um, on uh, physical disability cricket. And I wanted to introduce you to something that we're working on now, because I told you that the arena was the first uh, facility in England to be purpose designed to include the wheelchair athlete, which is astonishing when you think of the thousands of sports halls which have been created. Well, we're working at a project at the moment with the England Cricket Board to create the world's first inclusive cricket centre um, uh, in which people who are blind will also be able to practice um, uh, alongside, albeit divided by, by a wall, um, uh, when they're in the nets, um, alongside people who are sighted, uh, people who are first-class cricketers, children, uh, boys, women, men and girls, um, uh, to will all be there together using the same changing rooms, uh, having the same pleasure and joy. And this is a picture of the, uh, of the teams uh, at the uh, dinner that we hosted for them. Um, and uh, just a, an idea. And of course, you will know, I mean, here we have blind cricket being played, which of course is um, uh, played with, by hearing and with a soft ball and you have to wear a blindfold so that, if you, so that everybody has the same level of impairment. And of course, India are the holders of the Blind Cricket World Cup, um, and uh, the estimates vary greatly, but it is estimated that there may be up to a million children who have a visual impairment here in India. And of course, with 
cricket being such a great national popular sport, I know that you will want the children, uh, whether they have a visual impairment or not, to be able to enjoy. And this is where we're going to build it. That's the arena. And we've carefully bought um, some land at the back and to the side. And uh, in uh, two years' time, I hope that this will be filled up uh, with a, a new uh, center for cricket. Um, we signed off the designs for it, uh, the commission for the architect, uh, 10 days ago. Now, this brings me to the main item, which is Dr. Swaroop Sampatraba. And uh, here is Swaroop. Um, and uh, uh, teaching uh, characteristically this theme of getting down onto the same level. Swaroop has led us all to, to this. And here you see a picture of Swaroop uh, with an extra who has been hired for the day, um, uh, you can see. Um, and uh, she's actually the first person in the history of the university um, to have a double, to be a double doctorate. because she earned her PhD 10 years ago with a, a wonderful thesis on uh, all sorts of aspects of inclusive education. And of course, she's been doing great work, which you know um, a, a great deal about and which we're going to um, uh, learn more about today, I'm sure. And we were delighted to give her an honorary degree uh, a just a few weeks ago. And this is a picture in the hive, absolutely. Uh, and here is uh, Swaroop addressing uh, uh, the 2,000 people uh, at uh, Worcester Cathedral um, and, uh, and uh, in her honorary doctoral robes. And we've, we've got a fancy gown to have some more pictures later. Uh, I, I feel sure that um, uh, the combination of Swaroop and the fancy gown will attract photography uh, <laughs> in, in, in a great deal. And, and I'll try to be an extra uh, uh, and do my best. Uh, and I brought that gown along as well. Um, and I just want to say that having made this bridge to the uh, work uh, that we're doing with Swaroop, my, I've got my colleagues here, and Jordan, who's uh, head of education, uh, Pinky Jane, who plays such an important role in our uh, school of education at the university, um, and uh, um, right. Right, well, the, the minister has timed his arrival brilliantly. <laughs> Sir, it's a pleasure and an honor to meet you. And also, I mean, uh, I, I can see that uh, not only are you doing great work, but you are destined for great things because to make an entry just like that, as I'm about to come to the main point that I was trying to make in my speech is fantastic. So thank you, sir. And, 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 and the point that I was going to make is we are launching this diploma today, which uh, Swaroop and colleagues, uh, Anne, Pinky, and others have been working on uh, in education, which is to help teachers learn how to teach using drama and other ways so that children learn uh, critical life skills. And we go back to the idea of character and learning to be resilient in a rather difficult and changing modern world. Um, we think of the resilience that Mark Scriven had to show uh, to be able to win all the records um, and win all the matches that, that he had to win and to live his life when his father had um, hit him so hard at the age of 10 that he lost his sight and had abused him for so many years. And yet he's managed to go on and do such positive work now. And so um, we've... Uh, Swaroop has made uh, a, a short film, or a short film has, made, has been made featuring Swaroop, which I just want to uh, uh, play to you now, and that will really be the introduction to the uh, main course, which is to listen to Swaroop uh, and uh, how she is going to uh, help work with us all to further develop inclusion so important in our modern world. So let's have the film with Swaroop now, and we'll just dim the lights a little, and um, there we go. <laughs> I think children all over the world are the same, and they really deserve... Ladies and gentlemen, um, that's, uh, that's the beginnings of a bridge towards Swaroop. Um, and um, 
I'm just going to ask just a very few brief words to you and then introduce another film, Pinky. Friends, first of all, allow me to express my deep, deepest gratitude for this honor the University of Worcester has bestowed on me. I accept it joyfully for myself and on the behalf of the teachers and the children I have worked with since the last 15 years. At the same time, I'm delighted to share this moment with all of you who have gathered here and invited by us, for you are friends, some long-standing and some new. There is nothing on earth that is more prized than true friendship, and I'm grateful for the academic friendship that transcends borders and distances for the friendship that allows us to jointly explore the world in which we live, and for the friendship which allows us to share our successes. Um, there are a few people I would like to thank before I continue my speech, and um, two people who are very dear to me who are not here, but celebrated with me in the Wooster Cathedral, my director of studies, Dr. Philip Chamber, and my external examiner, Dr. Jack Whitehead. I also acknowledge the love and support of my family, without whom I would have never achieved what I have. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Paresh, Anirudh, Aditya, Emma, my whole family. I want to specially thank the University of Worcester for this important distinction. It's a great honor for many reasons. Because it was at Worcester that I started my journey as a teacher. I still remember the day I went there. It was a Sunday, and the university was absolutely empty. Not totally. The security was there. But I was sitting there on the steps, looking at the rolling Malvern halls hills and thinking, this is home. It was here that I learned a lot. It was here that I learned the importance of education. Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it, and by the same token, save it from ruin, which except for renewal, except for building of capacity to question, to explore, to view the world from other standpoint, it would be inevitable. Education, too, is when we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world and leave them abandoned. It was at Wooster that I learned about the equality of opportunity, the capacity to become different. I learned that there's a lot of reviewing required, using of imagination and taking of responsibility. When I went back home, I felt very alone. I do not wish to imply nobody cared, but I just want to say that in spite of the good intentions of the academics and ministries, children were actually traumatized but by what we call education in modern India. East looks west and west looks east, and yet there's a learning crisis in global education. In spite of education for all, no child left behind, every student succeeds, act, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, millions of children world over still can't read, write, and do basic maths. This learning crisis, instead of shortening the social gap, is increasing it. Children from economically vulnerable backgrounds, social minorities, the girl child, who are already disadvantaged by their circumstances, reach adult adulthood lacking in the most basic life skills. Somebody had to act. And I have a very simple mantra, and that is, if not me, then who? My grandmother used to tell me the story about one day, the earth was about to experience darkness for the first time. And the people began to panic. And they said, the sun will set and darkness will cover everything. What will happen to us? Darkness became arrogant and wanted to show its might. It set its foot on earth and people began to hide. But in one little hut, 
very far away in a corner, one little lamp raised its head and proclaimed, I challenge you, darkness. I will be the light for the people. If nothing else, I won't allow you to settle around me. I will establish light around me. Watching this, the other lamps in every hut in the world rose, and the world watched in amazement. These little lamps stop darkness from expanding. I believe, understanding our motivation, we apply a way to limit or to liberate. Social imagination, for me, is liberation. Imagination is what allows for empathy, for understanding other people's feelings, to begin a new interaction with the world. Social imagination allows us to envision life different from the one which we live. There is one beautiful story I read while I was doing my research. It's about a little boy and his, and his father. They got into the train, a little like our local trains, and there was absolutely no place in there. Somehow the father got the guy, little kid to sit down, gave him a paper and a pen and said, draw. This little kid looked around and after a moment, he started drawing. And after a bit, the father asked him, what are you drawing? So he says, Dad, I'm drawing you sitting in the train next to me. So the father said, there is no place on this train. So he says, not this train, the train in my drawing. In my train, there is a place for everyone to sit. But looking after the way Saurabhji is working, I think it has proved it is the way Saurabhji has found to appreciating such type of training of trainers, which is most may think. But he has to pass that through the teachers. And the teacher is a crucial in each and every way. And I think uh, in a country like India, we have mass education, so it is to deficient students, but in 2009, from right to education, we have adopted inclusive education, which was not here. Open board in Maharashtra, where the student need not go to day-to-day -to -day school, but he can be at par with other students, as there is a state board, other students, because the number of parents of the special kids approached us to discuss with Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Madam, Mr. Gayo, David, David, Thank you. Thank you.